Good morning. It's uh, 11 o'clock, so we can start this uh, <clears throat> webinar. Um, it's a pleasure and the privilege to have today uh, Dr. Jorge Blasquez. Uh, Jorge is, uh, is working for BP, but as you probably have the possibility to read in his uh, CV, has a different experience in different fields, by the way. So it means uh, in public sector, in private sector, in international organization, in a research institution of different, uh, in different countries. So a uh, broad experience uh, with the one only constant, which is energy, the energy market, uh, et cetera. So the organization uh, of uh, our uh, meeting is uh, as follows. There will be uh, 30 minutes presentation by Jorge and then uh, Enzo Di Giulio from uh, Scuola Mattei will act as a discussant. I will uh, have the privilege to, to, to give the floor first to Professor Galeotti to add a few words and then to Jorge. Marzio. Uh, good morning uh, also from my side. It is a pleasure to have Jorge uh, to give this seminar, not only because uh, the BP Energy Reports is uh, worldwide known, but also because Jorge, who's uh, uh, an energy economist and an expert, is also a good friend of us, uh, much like Enzo Di Giulio, who's going to discuss this. So I just going to say, I add my welcome for, by on behalf of uh, uh, Fondazione Mattei to Jorge. You can, you can thank go you. ahead. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much. For me, it's also um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. I mean, um, um, I had the privilege in the past of uh, working with uh, both professionally with uh, Alessandro and uh, Professor Galeotti, and. Um, not only they are great as a person, they are great as professional. And for me, it's real a pleasure to be here talking to you. So thank you very much to the Fundacion. Thank you very much to, to you uh, both and to the team that has helped me with, uh, with all putting all these pieces together. So thanks. This is the, my first um, statement. I'm going to enter directly into the presentation, which has the name Key Scenarios to Understand the Energy Transition. The first thing I want to say is that the uh, BP Energy Outlook, it's, um, it's a tool that was presented the same day as the new BP strategy. So um, it's something that has helped BP uh, to define a new strategy to, to transition to a net zero by 2050. By the way, all the information that I'm going to present is public. You can find it in the uh, BP web, web page. Even, uh, even there is a document like this that you can um, download with all the tables, the numbers, so nothing, nothing is uh, um, nothing is secret or, or private. So let's talk about the three scenarios that we have in mind. So you can see in this chart um, a blue light that represents the past of emissions between 2018 and 2000, um, 2018, which is the last um, day for which we have um, actual data, uh, 2019 and onwards. They Mr. Black, sorry to interrupt yes. you. Um, we were wondering if you could put uh, uh, full screen the, the presentation. Oh, um, sorry. No, sorry for the Like that? Amazing, perfect, thank you. Okay, Sorry. so you, you can see that there are three different, um, three different um, lines. The green line represent what we call business as usual. So this scenario represents the path of emissions if policies, technologies, and social preference evolve in a matter which is consistent with the recent past. The orange line is the rapid scenario, which is designed on the assumptions that um, emissions decline by around 70% compared with 2018, 70, sorry, 75%. And the main driver for this scenario are carbon prices, which in the developed world um, reached $2,050 per ton in 2050, and in emerging economies around 175. The blue line 
represents the net zero scenario. Here emissions uh, decline by 95%. There is one around one uh, gigaton of emissions of CO2 in 2050, but basically it's it's a scenario that has um, zero emissions. This scenario is different from rapid because we recognize that probably to achieve the decline that is needed in net zero, it's not only a matter of policies, also society have to change and have to uh, behave accordingly to this um, aspiration with the idea of reaching net zero. By the way, the three scenarios that I'm going to discuss are not forecast. I want to be very clear on this. I mean, we cannot predict the future. We, we know that we cannot predict the future. So these scenarios are designed to understand the uncertainties around the energy transition. Rather than to say what is going to happen, it simply defines like a bounds. And, and the idea is to, uh, to explain what are the levels of uncertainty of the energy transition. In this slide, you can see that to the previous chart, I have added two areas. One is pink and the other is blue. The pink area represents the um, range of, um, of scenarios of the IPCC scenario, so the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. The message of this slide is that RAPID is broadly aligned with those scenarios that in this data set, in the Intergovernmental Panel of Data Change, um, are consistent with an increase in global temperatures well below two degrees. The blue area, it's uh, represented scenarios which has an increase in uh, global temperature of 1.5. And basically, our net zero scenario is consistent with this second uh, type of scenario. So this is the only message I want from this slide. So rapid is consistent with having global temperatures well below two degrees. Net zero is consistent with having global temperatures well below 1.5. And most net zero scenarios are consistent with this uh, statement. How we move from business as usual to uh, rapid and to net zero? Well, there are three key drivers for the change from one um, scenario to the another. If you look at the, at the left-hand side of the chart, you can see that there are three different areas. The first area from the upper green line to the bottom orange lines is something that we call efficiency. This is the uh, reduction in emissions due to higher efficiency that we have in rapid. And this represents around 38, 40% of the change in emissions between rapid and business as usual. The area which is in, in the middle, which is um, pink dark, is the energy mix. And this is the, uh, the change in emissions, which is explained by the change in the use of energy. So this is basically transition from fossil fuels to um, decarbonized sources of energy. And the blue area at the very bottom is um, the last bit is carbon capture and storage. And um, this uh, represents the amount of emissions which are generated by fossil fuels and capture and storage, so remove from the atmosphere. Uh, the main driver for the change, it's um, between BAU and RAPID is the energy mix, which explain around 50% of the change, and then energy efficiency around the other um, 40%. Net from business as usual to net zero, the energy mix again represents 50% uh, and, and efficiency around 30%. If you look at the at the left of the uh, right hand side of the chart, you can see here that the main difference in carbon capture and storage between the two scenarios is probably the production of blue hydrogen. So hydrogen produced using coal and gas. So um, and as you can see, we have around five gigatons um, of emissions in year 2050, which are captured between four and five, depending on the um, scenario. So this is broadly speaking a description of the scenarios. Now I'm going to discuss six points about the energy transition. 
And, and these are the core of the presentation. First is, what do we know? The second is, um, how all demand is going to be affected by mobility? How electricity and powers will shape the future? What is the role of hydrogen and bioenergy? What is the investment little needed to, uh, for the energy transition? And finally, what are the dangers of delaying the energy transition? Very quickly, um, the following two slides are the core of the energy outlook. And it has three charts. This chart that you are seeing here is the share of um, fossil fuels in primary energy. In the three cases, there is a decline in the share of fossil fuels, even in business as usual. But which is really important is that in the three scenarios, there is a decline in the absolute level of uh, consumption of fossil fuels. And this is something which is truly it has no um, has no precedent because in the past energy transition has been about adding new type of energy but in this case is not adding new type of energy renewables but also declining of um, existing fossil fuel consumption so this is the key first matches message of the energy uh, of the energy outlook in the three scenarios there is a decline in the absolute absolute consumption of fossil fuels the second key message is not a surprise. The three scenarios has a substantial increase in renewables um, consumption. In the three scenarios, renewables, and by the way, renewable energy in BP outlook does not include hydro energy, which is treated independently. So it's mostly more than renewables, wind, solar, geothermal, biomass. So in the three scenarios, Renewables are going to penetrate the energy system faster than any other fuel in the past. Again, this is a characteristic of the three scenarios that we have. And the last one has to do with the electricity consumption. And in the three scenarios, we have electricity increasing by doubling, basically, so increasing by 80%. And as you can see here, electricity um, will move around 20% of total final consumption to something between 35 and 55, depending on the scenario. So massive increase in consumption of electricity. These are the three key messages of the, of the um, BP energy um, outlook. And, and let me explain how this is going to impact the energy mix and what are the implications for the energy outlook. So these charts represent the share of the, um, the, the energy mix or the path of the energy mix from 1900. So it's, it's 150 years. If you look at the first part of the charts between 1900 and 1945, it's mostly a history of one fuel, which is coal. And then we have oil adding into the second part. So it's mostly, and a scenario driven by two fuels only, which is coal and, um, and oil. In the middle, so in the last part of the 20th century, we have also natural gas coming uh, into the picture and a little bit of other type of uh, non fuels like nuclear energy or hydro, for example. But between 2020 and 2050, you can see that most of the fuels, perhaps renewables is a little bit, um, different but there is a there is a variety a mix a richness in, in the type of energy that we are using so is the story of energy has moved to the story of one or two fuels to something that has multiple type of um, energy and this has chart has implications and and also the charts that we have uh, the three charts that i showed in the previous slide first this de diversification of fuels represent more market power for consumers. So consumers are going to have greater power. Second, there is a need for integration of energy. Is uh, this is why electricity has um, a much bigger role in this uh, in the future than today. And also hydrogen is going to have a, a bigger role because they are instruments to integrate this different type of energy. Markets are also going to be more local. I mean, um, coal and trade and gas are traded globally. Electricity and hydrogen are going to be more, more local markets, more dominated by local trends. And finally, 
this market, this chart is also suggesting greater competition among producers. So a very different story is going to be what we are going to see in the next 30 years. And these are the four key uh, takeaways of the chart. Diversification, greater power, diversification of energies and greater power for consumers. Need of integration of energy, higher role for hydrogen and electricity. Markets are going to be more focused, greater competitions among consumers. Let's move to the uh, first question to the second question right now which is how might oil demand will be affected by the mobility revolution this chart oil consumption in the three scenarios so in business as usual oil demand peak around 2025 and then decline a little bit we have around today around 100 million barrels of oil which are consumed and this scenario says that in 2050 we will have 90 million in the other two in rapid and in net zero there is a dramatic change there's a, a dramatic reduction uh, in the consumption of oil you can see that in rapid oil consumption is around 50 million barrels per day and in net zero is around 20 million barrels per day so a substantial important change important shift towards different um, type of energy what is driving this change in oil demand well the main driver it's um, is transportation if you see these three the, in these three bars in the chart, which is in, in the right hand side, you can see a blue bar, dark and light, and a yellow bar that represents change in demand by transportation. The, the light blue is passenger cars, um, dark blue is other type of, of transportation, and, and yellow represents the decline in another type of transport. So the transport sector explains around 50% at minimum of the decline in um, in the, the consumption of fuels, and it is not only is not only um, a shift from oil to electricity; it's also more efficiently used of oil. So transportation is going to be more efficient. This is this is something I want to share with you in this slide. So you have two charts. The chart in the left hand side represents the change in in um, in primary energy consumed by the transport sector and you can see that between now and 2030 there is an increase in primary energy consumed which is in between now and between 2018 and net zero is around 30 percent but have in mind that in these scenarios road and air travels for example doubles they have an increase of almost 100 percent all the additional demand of energy for transport comes from emerging regions this is another important message from this transportation if you go to the other side of the chart to the to the left hand side you can see here that there's going the today in 2018 oil is the main source of energy primary energy for transportation 2015 may be well very different there is a significant role for electricity in particular in rubbing and net zero and also for hydrogen and natural gas um, in these two scenarios so the key message of this slide is that there is an increase in, in energy demand for transportation but not much so we think energy is going to be uh, used more efficiently but also in the scenarios which are consistent with net, with the Paris Agreement, which are rapid and net zero, there is also a shift to different types of energy, in particular electricity and hydrogen. Let me talk a little bit about the mobility revolution or that we see. So in this chart, you can see the um, share of, um, of kilometers which are electrified. Today, in 2020, for cars and truck, it's a very small percentage, it's very close to, to zero. In the three scenarios, we expect a massive increase in electrification of, of uh, transportation of, of cars and trucks. In particular, in, in rapid, 
in, in rapid and, and net zero, it is around 75% is going to be electrified in business as usual. It's only, it's going to be about 25%. This is a massive increase in the three scenarios. And we think that this is not only going to be the only change. We also think that there is going to be a revolution in the way we use car. So this chart represents the penetration of what we call robotaxis, which is, um, for example, Uber or Cabify in Spain, fully electric and autonomous, so without a driver. And we think that in 2035, 2040, around 50% of the um, distant travel using, um, using private cars is going to be uh, using this shared mobility. Electric, fully autonomous, so um, having a car probably is going to be um, something that perhaps is, 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 is not longer um, as it was when I was a young guy, which having a car was key. For younger generation, mobility is going to be the key, not owning the car. And, and the way they are going to move is going to be uh, uh, very different. I mean, we can discuss about this, but I mean, oh, really, if, if you have a chat with people in their early 20s, for them, having a driver license is, is not critical. For me, it was, and I'm sure for Marsha and Alessandro, it was also. Uh, so, so it's not only a revolution happening in transport because we are moving away from oil and we are electrifying, it's the way we are going to use cars is going to be also changed. So shifting to electricity and power markets, as I said before, there is going to be a massive increase in the demand of electricity. In, in the three scenarios, electricity almost doubled, so increased by 80%. Surprisingly, in the three scenarios, the increase in electricity is more or less the same, is 20,000 terawatts. What is different, and this is what you can see in the chart, which is in the, left hand, in the right hand side, in the three bars, is the use or the, the sector which is using this electricity. In rapid at net zero, transportation represents um, a significant share of this consumption of electricity. In, uh, in business as usual, it's buildings, so it's mostly electricity used for heating and cooling purposes, was is driving the main increase in electricity demand. And it, this, this increase in, in buildings is completely driven by increasing prosperity in emerging economies. So the message from this slide is that if we continue, uh, I mean, if, if the energy system evolves in a matter which is consistent with business as usual, we're going to see a lot of electricity use for um, buildings and for, for heating and cooling in buildings associated to growing prosperity. In the other two, you have the same effect, but energy efficiency compensates this, this increase in electricity. And we see an increase in electricity coming mostly from transportation. Industry, there is also an increase in electricity, but, but uh, it's, it's mostly identical in the three uh, key sectors. Have in mind also, and this is something which is important to understand the role of hydrogen, that according to a recent study of the International Energy Agency, around two thirds of um, activities can be electrified. There is one third of activities that cannot be electrified. These are what we call hard to abate uh, sectors, which um, you have cement, steel, heavy duty transport, uh, aviation, shipping, so some, uh, there, are, there are a group of activities where electricity is not a solution and they have to go for something, for something different. How are we going to electrify the, uh, the, um, the uh, energy, the, the power system? So uh, you can see here three different charts that represent the share of um, power generation in the three scenarios. I have three key messages from this slide. The first is that in rapid and net zero, renewables explain all the increase in electricity demand. So the increase that I show in this chart, this 20,000 terawatts of additional electricity which is needed is going to be produced with renewables. 
in rapid and net zero, and around 70% of that is going to be produced with renewables in wind and solar. In rapid and net zero, there is a massive decline in coal consumption, which almost disappeared in net zero. And um, natural gas is more resilient in, uh, in uh, rapid, but there is also a decline in natural gas consumption for um, in, in net zero. In, in business as usual, the share of um, coal in electricity is more or less constant. And the last key message is, is has to do with the orange line, which is wind and solar technologies. You see that when they reach around 50%, 60% of penetration, they tend to decline the rate of growth of penetration. The reason is associated with intermittency and other type of energy which are needed to balance the energy system. And this is something that you will see in the following chart, this, this uh, point in which you sit from fossil fuels to solar technologies, but there is a level of penetration in which intermittency represents um, higher cost and you need something different from uh, wind and solar. What else are we going to see in, in, in um, fully decarbonized um, energy uh, systems? Because in rapid and net zero, in rapid, the energy intensity, the carbon intensity of, of um, the grids declined by almost 90% in net zero is negative. So the power sector is used to offset emissions from other sectors. What are we going to use? Well, still, I think the uh, people are exploring the type of technologies which are going to, uh, to accompany um, um, uh, solar and wind technologies. Batteries, no doubt, is going to be used in particular for bal balancing the energy grids in, in seconds and minutes and probably hours, but more that for seasonal balancing, it's, it's difficult to see batteries. We have pump hydro also, which is uh, it's going to be used. Demand response, so disconnecting or connecting, depending if you are producing more or less. Hydro, in particular those we have uh, high capacity reservoirs and for seasonal balancing we see hydrogen also we have gas or coal with carbon capture and storage and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and storage which is also a source of negative emissions i'm not going to go deeper into this because um, this is something which is still being um, discussed and as we have new technologies the views on how to balance a power system that has penetration of renewables of 60, 65, 75%, it's, um, it's being discussed. So what is the role for hydrogen and bioenergy? This is the fourth question. I said before that electricity, so two thirds of, of uh, activities can be electrified, but there's still there is one third which is hard pertaining to hard to about sectors that require something different. Well, there is a growing consensus that hydrogen can play a role in this. And in our scenarios, I mean, um, uh, in rapid hydrogen represent around 6% or 7% of, um, of total, total um, the, the total uh, consumption of final energy corresponds to, um, to um, hydrogen. 60% of total final energy consumed is hydrogen in net zero. And in business as usual, as uh, the system is not fully decarbonized, we see very little role for hydrogen in, in, this, um, in this scenario. But you can see here that there is a significant change, in particular, in the last part of the outlook, in the last 15 years, when the role of solar and wind, it's more difficult and, um, because in this scenario, what you do is you decarbonize Fed, what is easier to decarbonize electricity. You electrify those sectors which are easy to electrify. But then at the very at the last part of the energy outlook, when we enter in those how to abate sectors, we need this uh, this uh, role for um, for um, for hydrogen. Um, what type of hydrogen are we going to use? 
I mean, the uh, European Union, for example, has a strong bias towards um, or a strong preference toward wing hydrogen. So this is hydrogen produced using electrolyzers, mostly coming from wind and solar. So it's electricity produced using renewables. We see also a role for blue hydrogen, which is hydrogen produced using coal and gas with carbon capture and storage. And in both scenarios, the share of, of uh, blue and green hydrogen is more or less 50% each. Perhaps it's a little bit higher the rate of, of green hydrogen than, than blue hydrogen. But in general terms, we have 50% of both. And why is the reason for that? Why do we think that there is a role for for blue hydrogen in the decarbonization? Well, this has to do with the pace at which we can deploy renewable energy. Here you can see uh, in this um, chart, which is in, in the left-hand side, three lines that represent deployment of renewables in rapid natural and business as usual. In the three cases, there is um, an annual increase, which is um, accelerating compared to what we have today. Um, just to give you, um, to tell you, um, the last year uh, we have a deployment of around 250 gigawatts and it was the highest um, of history. But in the next 15 years, so in the short term, in, in the case of um, business uh, as usual, this level has to be maintained. In rapid, we have to increase this number to 350 gigawatts of deployment average per year. And in net zero, it has to be around 50. Uh, 550 gigawatts uh, per year. Um, you can see that around 3, 2035, 2040, deployment reaches like a plateau, there is a hump, and then decline. It's not that we are not adding, but we are adding at a lower speed. And this has to do with the problems associated with the intermittency and the higher cost of. Um, of um, electricity. As you can see in the chart, in the chart which is uh, next to it, which is in the in the in the right hand side, you can see two bars that represent the power which is used to generate electricity, which is finally consumed by by uh, final end sectors, which is transport, industry, and buildings, and the uh, amount of um, of um, uh, electricity, amount of um, of uh, wind and solar, of renewables, which is dedicated to produce green hydrogen, and and it's quite significant. So it's it's not something which is minor. This chart is the same as this one here, but we have added one line. This dotted blue line, which is at the top, represent um, the amount of additional wind and solar installed capacity needed to fully decarbonize the production of uh, hydrogen. So to fully move from blue hydrogen to green, to green hydrogen. As you can see, there is some, a substantial, a significant increase, not only with rapid, but also with net zero. And in our opinion, having something which is more balanced, which is blue and green hydrogen to produce, is going to make the, um, the decarbon full decarbonization of the power system easier. Because um, as we add green hydrogen, the amount of wind and solar is increased. And this is going to make the challenge to achieve the amount um, needed to decar fully decarbonize the power system more difficult. This is why we see a role for blue hydrogen in, in, um, in this scenario. This is biomass, bioenergy. I'm not going to speak about this. Um, this is the last, we are entering in the last part of the presentation. It's going to take me only five minutes more. Uh, how much um, investment do we need to achieve those scenarios? So. One of the key messages is that there is going to be a massive increase in the deployment of renewables. As you can see, um, electricity generation coming from wind and solar is going to multiply in the next 30 years by a minimum of seven in business as usual, usual 
to a maximum of 11 times, so really massive increases in electricity produced with renewable um, generation. And partly of this is explained by the decline in the cost. You can see here a chart which is in the left hand side, which um, which explain that in winds tend to decline around 55% with the cost that it has today and solar around 60 uh, 60 and this decline of around sorry 30 and 60% is um, is driven by the learning curve so the more deployment you have the more you learn how to produce renewables the lower the cost of renewables so this is something that you have uh, in mind so we have massive decline of renewables but cheaper renewables however still the three scenarios have very different amounts of investment in wind and solar as you can see here in, in today we have around 300 billions i'm talking about the uh, the uh, left hand side of the chart where you can see in the top of the chart the amount of investment in wind and solar then oil and gas and then carbon capture and storage if you can see the blue bar represents the amount of investment today, which is around 300 billion in renewables. In BAU, this is around 350 billion on average. Rapid is almost doubling that amount, 550. At net zero, it's around 700 billion on average per year. So it's it's uh, multiply um, clearly uh, by two. And this is obviously has the other side of the coin is it's that we need to invest less in oil and gas. It, 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 we still have to invest in oil and gas in the three scenarios, even that, for example, in uh, the amount of oil consumed in 2050 is only is 80% below that today. It requires um, some um, billions of investment per year. So today we are investing around 800 billion in oil and gas. In business as usual, this in this amount is mostly around 750 billion, which is the green bar. In the two other scenarios, which is rapid and net zero, there is a massive decline in in um, in in, um, in this uh, investment, and it's around 400 billion in rapid and 300 billion per year on net zero. So there is a shift. The amount that we're investing today in oil and gas has to be invested in wind and solar. And the amount that we're investing today in wind and solar has to be invested in oil and gas. This is more or less the uh, a rule of thumb for the uh, for the shift in, in, uh, in investment. Let me go to the last slide. The last slide has to do with, well, what happened if we do nothing, but suddenly uh, the world decide, decide this that we need to transition. And this is what we have explored in this scenario, which is a high level scenario. So this scenario has been constructed using the following assumptions, which is in this scenario, what we call delayed and disorderly, the level of emissions in, um, is identical to the one that we have in business as usual. So there is no transition at all. In 2030, there is a trigger, something happens. And the society and the world decided that has to reach the same level of emissions, cumulative, so that the absolute emissions emitted between today and 2050 has to be identical as in rapid. So uh, mathematically, the area which is below the red line, which is this delayed and disorderly, at the orange line, which is rapid, in terms of uh, emissions um, emitted are the same. And we imposed that in this new scenario, you can shift from fossil fuels to renewable at the same speed that you did in rapid. And the efficiency can move at the same speed that in rapid. But logically, because we have 10 less years, the uh, this is not enough to reach the level of emissions so the or, the only tool that we have it's rationing the demand of energy so it's simply saying you cannot do this activity because it's consume 
energy. And this is the amount of energy which, uh, which uh, is needed to be cut it or reduced or rationed to achieve this scenario, it's almost 50%. So have in mind, for example, that in 2020, some activities were banned, in particularly related to transportation and mobility. The decline, the declining energy consumed was around four, uh, was around 4.5%, and the reduction in emission was 6%. So this scenario is saying that um, this has to be um, done almost by 10 years sustain so every day every every year you have to re to reduce this four five percent per year to achieve a 50 percent reduction what is the message of this slide well that this delay and disorderly scenario is something which is going to be really painful uh, not only for the society but also if you are a producer of um, energy which is um, which is not fully decarbonized so this is the key the key message of the scenario this is a scenario that has a lot of economic cost and this is the last slide of my presentation and i'm going to um, to stop here if uh, you don't mind I'm, I'm i'm open for questions thank you very much for your very useful presentation and very comprehensive presentation and of course it's uh, as slides uh, to be considered carefully uh, because of course uh, they have content in it um, as uh, as uh, as we know now we have the discussion by Enzo 10 minutes thank you very much Enzo thank you thank you Alessandro can you see the slides uh, yes Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blasquez, for your presentation that, uh, as Alessandro said, uh, is interesting and useful. We have a big need for data and reflection on data in, 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 in this period. I try to understand where the BP scenarios are in the context of uh, the many scenarios that uh, we can find, and I was uh, lucky in finding uh, this uh, new paper by the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies uh, that shows a uh, uh, set of scenarios. And this is for natural gas. And we can see that for natural gas, uh, the BP uh, scenarios is quite moderate. Uh, on the contrary, for oil, it is uh, quite uh, aggressive, as, as, as you can see. It is uh, the, uh, the reduction, sorry, the reduction in, uh, in the oil consumption is, is very, very big. Uh, having said this, uh, um, what emerges uh, in, in your scenarios, but not only in yours, is that uh, in order to go towards uh, net zero, we need uh, a strong increase uh, in renewables. Uh, and uh, there is a slide uh, that uh, surprised me uh, in, 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 in the report. Uh, uh, you did not show it uh, today, but it is uh, in the report, and it is uh, these slides that shows uh, the speed of uh, the current transition. And uh, uh, here we see that uh, the speed uh, of renewables uh, after having reached the one percent compared to the other uh, fuels, uh, for instance, oil, gas, nuclear, hydro, is is uh, is very very fast and. Uh, so this uh, slide is something that uh, gives us uh, some hopes because it tells that uh, we are going faster. And uh, so that was surprising uh, for me because uh, on the basis of my personal experience of, of data and also of my reading, uh, my idea is that the transition is not going uh, fast. Uh, and uh, here I rely on the famous uh, expert and uh, one of the major experts of energy, energy transition of like as Baklav Smil, uh, who says that uh, the increase of new renewables, uh, the solar and uh, uh, wind uh, is, uh, uh, the cargo is about 3%. And uh, if you compare it with the coal or oil and natural gas, you can see that there you can find a higher uh, CAG, for instance, for coal, more than 5%, for oil, more than 8%, for natural gas, more than 6%. And I think that in these uh, uh, 
uh, words, there is also an answer to that uh, distance between the, uh, so the BP hypothesis that we are going fast and uh, the, uh, the Smil hypothesis that is, is talking about the model renewable. So an issue is uh, uh, which renewables we are referring to. And another issue is the way in which we calculate renewables, because when you go inside the renewables, the data, you, you can find a, a divergence. And I, I try to un understand uh, how the BP calculates uh, renewables and uh, how the International Energy Agency uh, does it. Uh, so this is uh, the BP statistical review uh, this year. And uh, so you have a 55% hydro and then 45% renewables. And in that, in that you have uh, uh, solar wind, but also bioenergy. Uh, so for the International Energy Agency, so the sum is the same. We are around 69 exajoule, but as you can see here, hydro is 23% uh, and no longer 55. And you have a big uh, slice, uh, which is uh, a modern solid bioenergy, basically pellets. Uh, uh, and so this is uh, quite quite odd. So we 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 need also a clarification in 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 in, in, the, in, in data. Uh, I mean, in, in general, I'm not referring to BB, but that, that is a big, uh, a big topic. And uh, when we go to see uh, these uh, uh, 69 exajoule, uh, they are about 12% uh, of total primary for uh, the International Energy Agency, 13% for BP. And uh, you go to see modern renewable here, uh, they are very, very small. They are uh, around 2%. So this 2% is the share of renewable since uh, more or less uh, 2015, 2016, and it does not uh, increase. And the key issue of the uh, net zero uh, target is that uh, these uh, new uh, model renewables should increase a lot. So these are the cargo present uh, in, uh, in the net zero emissions by the International Energy Agency. And they, here you can see for solar and wind that the numbers are astonishing. They are very, very big and the same uh, uh, for for BP, so they are a bit more moderate for for wind, and also because uh, the target is 59% uh, of the share of renewables uh, in 2050 versus 67 in uh, 2050 for the International Energy Agency. So what what we see is that uh, the speed is not so fast, uh, and uh, the, so the process of decarbonization currently is is very very is very very slow. And you can see by looking at the energy mix here, I refer to 2019 because 2020 was uh, an odd year because of the pandemic. And what is amazing is that when you go to study the, uh, the, the carbon intensity of uh, energy, you find that it does not move. It is, it is, uh, it is uh, at the same level. And this is, uh, this is uh, terrible. And one can think that this happens because you take into consideration primary energy. But actually, if you take into consideration uh, uh, the electric sector, you, you end up with uh, higher numbers. You can see that the, the carbon intensity is even higher. What is here positive is that there is uh, some movement. You can see uh, some decrease between uh, 18 and 19. And another piece of good news is uh, that there are areas in the world in which the numbers are lower and also the pace is faster for instance the european union so we could ask ourselves uh, if the speed is the speed between 18 and 18 when we go to zero carbon uh, intensity and here you have the answer which is uh, absolutely for the primary energy at the world level planetary level uh, it is uh, a very 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 bad a very bad answer and here you have uh, uh, a representation of the different areas uh, uh, when we go to zero in different areas. So you can see there are modern countries, let's say rich countries, USA, uh, European Union, and Japan, uh, that are quite fast, but uh, there are other areas uh, that are out of range. Another key issue that you, 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 you demand very, very well is the issue of uh, the electricity penetration because uh, we need green energy, but also green energy that penetrates. And it is not penetrating because uh, what happens is that uh, in areas like the US, it is uh, decreasing. The share of uh, renewables on total final consumption is decreasing, is not increasing. In Europe and Japan, it is uh, 
quite stable. And if uh, we repeat our experiment uh, when we reach uh, um, the, the, when, where, when, where we go at the pace of uh, 18 uh, 19, uh, we find uh, the, these results here. You can see that the US, uh, the European Union, and Japan they are out of, of range. So another issue is uh, uh, how to move uh, how to move uh, the the big boat, uh, and uh, these are uh, the numbers of the carbon tax by the BP reports uh, uh, that are quite high and that they are quite uh, in line uh, with the, the numbers of the International Energy Agency. Here you see the numbers, so they are they are quite. Uh, Close uh, and of course there are some countries that are moving uh, towards uh, these uh, uh, these targets. Uh, uh, we are we are now seeing also China that is implementing its, its ETS, even if there is at the moment an oversupply of uh, of allowances. Uh, uh, but as a matter of fact, the the average uh, carbon tax at world level is uh, is very very low. Is uh, Two dollars, and it should, it should go to two hundred dollars. So, and then, so having uh, this shift uh, is, uh, is 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 a key issue. So, do we have the the political strength for doing uh, uh, this? Uh, we have seen uh, an experiment at the, in Europe. No, uh, the the carbon tax that uh, Mr. Macron tried to implement in France, and we have seen the results. And uh, and uh, we are now in these days uh, uh, reading uh, about uh, the new uh, Fit for 45 uh, package by the European Union, that, and we see that uh, again France, uh, on the basis of this uh, bad experience of the yellow jacket, is uh, is is very very uh, cautious. So. Uh, uh, this uh, will, uh, will will be something that will be on the table of discussion, I think, in the, in the in the next year. I want to close with uh, this slide uh, because you mentioned uh, uh, the expansion of oil, uh, which starts uh, after 1877. That was uh, the 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 year in which uh, was the first uh, uh, Wimbledon tournament. Uh, so there were 200 people uh, as spectators. Uh, and as you, you can see here, uh, uh, the, 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 the GDP was very, very little. Uh, and also, uh, we, sorry, and also uh, the population, the world population was a fraction of the current world population. So basically, that was the transition of rich countries because energy was only in the rich countries. Now we have a, a larger landscape. And so having this transition, I think, it will be. Uh, very, very, very difficult. So, any uh, uh, reflection like yours uh, that puts uh, data reflections on data on this topic, I think, are very, very useful. Thank you. I stop here. I hope to be you, uh, in uh, ten minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I presume that probably hours were not enough uh, to give uh, all the <laughs> answer. Uh, you're asking if uh, Holger, if you allowed me, I I can briefly uh, add some questions uh, coming from the floor, so you can give a say a total more or less answer. The first one uh, is uh, what is uh, the role of carbon dioxide removal in the sense of negative emission technologies in your in your scenarios. The second one is something like, uh, what is the impact of robot access and similar technology to, tra to transport? Um, and another question that has been put in different form in different way, what is your opinion, idea about critical mineral markets and batteries and what will be the future of this uh, part of the market? Uh, another one, it's uh, basically asking your opinion on uh, the way energy intensive industry are lobbying in the Uni in the European Union, and if you feel comfortable with the proposal uh, from the the Grünen, I, I guess uh, the Green Party. Um, 
to end with internal flight inside Germany within a few years. If you have any opinion, and then uh, and that and then that's it. Last uh, comment uh, to Enzo. Next time you say Mr. Macron in France, you can be killed and guillotina. President Macron. I, sh okay. I should say King uh, Macron. <laughs> <laughs> Jorge. Okay, so Vincenzo, fantastic presentation, I must say. <laughs> so yeah, you, you have touched all the uh, the key elements of, of the energy transition. I mean, I cannot answer all, all the questions. Let me explain that, yes, there is a divergence in the methodology used by the International Energy Agency and BP. We use what is called um, the uh, substitution methodology. So for each kilowatt or megawatt of electricity produced with renewables, we compute or estimate the amount of oil and gas needed to produce the equivalent amount of electricity. Um, there is a table in the web page or somewhere where we explain how this is done, but it's, uh, Every time I go with this, it's a pain. I, uh, and we have to do a lot of uh, conversions to going back because the IPPC scenarios use some methodology, the International Energy Agency use another, and we use um, another. I think that being an oil and gas uh, company uh, in the past explained why we opt initially for this um, system. But uh, I admit this, it's something we, every, every year, I have been in BP three years, Every time we produce a document, we think is this is the best way to, uh, but still, I mean, it has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, yes. About the chart, the, the famous chart that shocked you, I mean, if, if, you, if you can put it, I, I don't have it because I went for something different about investment, but it is true. I mean, renewables are going to penetrate the energy system faster than any fuel in the past. And, in, in our opinion, the key message of this slide where you see ramping renewables very fast is that things has to be done in a different way to achieve net zero or rapid. I mean, if we continue doing things as in the past, this is not, this is not going to happen. Something has to be done different. And this is the key messages of rapid and net zero. What are the uh, good news of this? We have looking at the amount of investment needed to transition from what we have today to something equal to net zero and to rapid. And for the energy system, it's around 3% of total investment at a global level per year, more or less. So it's, it's not something which is massive speaking. I mean, it's, it's a, it requires a significant change in investors and companies and consumers. And, um, but uh, but it's something it's doable. I mean, it, it's something that policies and society within uh, can achieve. Something which is really interesting and which has happened during the pandemic is the uh, the view that society and governments have about net zero. If I remember correctly, it was 2015 when Sweden Sweden announced that she will implement net zero by 2050 in law. Today, countries that have this in law or has committed to achieve net zero, achieve 70% of global emissions. You have United States with Biden, the European Union, China, this, this commitment for 2060, the UK, Japan, Korea. So there is a movement of, of, um, of governments which are committed or have announced that they are committed to achieve net zero. I think I, we have to value this positively. It is true, and you have pointed out, that we have the impression that the energy transition is not progressing fast enough. And um, renewables are reaching new maximum of high penetration every year. Every year we see a new record in, in solar and wind. Uh, beating them, themselves uh, substantially. 2020, despite the COVID, has not been different. But still, for example, they have made no dent in um, emissions from coal in the power sector. So 
what happened and and we have been thinking a lot and 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 the problem is that emerging economies and emerging markets has very different drivers for europe it's easier to decarbonize the energy system because energy growth is not there is no growth in energy there is no growth in electricity so every time you add renewables you displace something from the energy mix in emerging economies it's different you need renewables but you also need new uh, source of energy there is an academic paper that says that um, something which is key and i mentioned at the beginning of the presentation is energy efficiency i think it's not it's not only critical the amount of energy you are displacing from fossil fuels is how would is the society to uh, to preserve the um, or to use the energy rather than using more energy we also have to learn how to use it in a better way um, about the internal flights of uh, germany i think this is a good example of societal preference i'm, I'm not going to comment um, i mean if they think they it is a good idea to to move uh, without planes domestically and it's something that society votes and choose um, i mean it's it's uh, it's um, i mean it's a reflection of the social preference about how we we use energy that that's it um, carbon removal i mean the only technology that we are using in this system is bex which is uh, bioenergy with um, negative um, with carbon capture we, we produce some uh, negative emissions uh, it's not much i cannot remember but we for example we don't use other type of carbon dioxide removals like direct direct carbon capture or things like that we, we only use bex as part of power generation um, and all the studies suggest that this is going to have a role because there are some sectors which are really hard to decarbonize and we need some type of, of negative emissions. Um, uh, for example, um, natural solutions like reforestation or afforestation most likely is going to have a, a role, an important role in, 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 in rapid and net zero, but we don't have that in those scenarios. Um, mineral critical markets. Um, yes it's a good question we produce another report which is called the statistical review every every year where we track the production of these uh, critical markets but i don't have enough knowledge to say if there is going to be some type of shortage of um, or problem with that so um, it's not my field of ex expertise and i'm i'm not going to comment because i simply i don't know uh, lobby and the role of bp in the energy transition i mean i think that the and this is a personal opinion you you can disagree but the the idea the energy the the, the new um uh, the, the new strategy of bp is quite bold i think it's uh, it, it it has said we are going to reduce oil and gas production by 40% in the next 10 years that we are increasing um, and significant multiplying the amount of renewals that we have that we are going to go for electric uh, um, vehicles and to i think it's increased by uh, seven or ten the amount of of uh, green green points uh, to recharge electric vehicles so there is there is a true transition from from being of an oil it's called international company to integrated energy company so i think we we are pretty comfortable with the new um, situation about net zero and decarbonizing the energy mix i personally i don't think there is there is a problem with that and i'm going to stop here because um, i don't know how you have the time um, alessandro i'm okay. happy to continue but uh, it's up to you uh, thank you very much and uh the only thing I, I think is safe for us is to send you the couple of questions they are looking for an answer and then uh, if you want to send me the answer back I can provide answer to the people that present the questions. 
Uh, from my side, I thank you very much, but I would like to give the floor to Professor Galeotti for the closing of this uh, very, very nice uh, seminar workshop. Marcia. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very, an excellent presentation, a great discussion. I think that both uh, uh, enriched us because they made, uh, they increased our, under our understanding of the problems related to the process of decarbonization. As Fondazione Mattei, we plan to continue these kind of meetings and these kind of discussions. And therefore, while I thank uh, colleagues, uh, uh, great eco energy economists and friends, Jorge and Enzo, uh, we wish you, we wish all uh, a great summer vacation, hopefully without too many complications around. And we will. Uh, uh, get back to you in the uh, beginning of uh, the fall from September. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao a tutti. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao.